So I was reading um, it online last night, and I, I couldn't get to sleep because I didn't want to put it down. This is in 121 pages. He says everything you need to know about like the housing struggle. Um, he started um, off organizing um, the ev ev eviction defense network in the 90s when people were getting displaced and the dot-com boom was on the horizon and it was basic like street level organizing where a group would get together when they found out somebody was getting evicted and they might do a little demonstration in front of the landlord's house and you know very grassroots work. And um, over the years, he has uh, done a lot of things and, and is, in fact, the co-founder of the San Francisco um, Community Land Trust, which is looking at preserving um, um, buildings in the land trust model. I, I know even before this that it had a successful um, um, saved a building in Chinatown. Um, that was going to be torn down for gentrification uh, uh, in a gentrification process. In fact, he doesn't really, he likes to prefer talking about housing as an issue of displacement because that's the end result of gentrification. And uh, to sum it up, like in the beginning of the book, there's a quote by um, Herbert Marcuse, and it says, you know, the housing, the housing um, problem isn't happening because the system isn't working. It's happening because the system is working. Because this is a system that was, you know, designed to put profits over people and, 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 and to displace people and, um, and everything. So to, to look at it in that context is a, a way of flipping it over. And um, I just recommend that people get this book because when I go home after this, I'm going to go home, put a cup pot of coffee, and read it in depth. Thank you very much. And here, here's, here's Mr. Tracy. One of the great architects of the civil rights movement, Ella J. Baker, observed that movements are built mostly on the hard work of the people behind the scenes. Those who would prepare the flyers, make phone calls, make sure that food is there, secure spaces for people to come together and find common cause. So today I'm really privileged to be the person who gets to come in here and talk. And uh, so uh, with that, I want to thank all of the organizers, all of the leaders that have made this day happen, but also especially Elena Goot, who uh, is responsible for me, uh, coming here. So when we organize for our neighborhoods, when we organize for our homes, when you do it year after year, it comes very, very discouraging. It feels like a Sisyphus rock sometimes because you win that, you, you win that campaign, you stop that eviction, then four years later, uh, that landlord's back, just like Freddy Krueger, right? Uh, saying, I'm gonna come back. Or Jason from Friday the 13th, saying, I'm back and I'm gonna take it this time, right? I'm gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna take everything that I didn't take the last time. And, it, and psychically, it can be very damaging. But what I want to start off with is the idea that every single last campaign that the Washington State Tenants Union takes on has an aspect that win or lose, you've already won. You've already won by stepping up. And I don't mean that in a, you know, in a just pat on the back, it's okay, it's good that you, uh, it's good that you tried, it's always good that you try, but I mean that you're telling a story. Over the past 40 plus years in the United States, we've had this thing called neoliberalism, right? We've had this economic, uh, this version of, of capitalism, it's not anything, it's like capitalism with the happy ma mask taken off, right? But We've had this, this version of capitalism was very distinctly different from the strategy that, uh, that, came, that came before it. It told a story that there are expendable human beings, right? Neoliberalism, the uh, system that we li live in now, tells a story that some people in our cities, some people in our neighborhoods are expendable. And it has a project of turning around all that animosity that was going upwards, that was going towards powerful people making bad decisions that were hurting other people, that were starting wars, and then 
turning it towards the homeless person, right? So in the 60s and the 70s, we had all these wonderful movements. I mean, they had their problems, certainly. They had their contradictions. Sometimes they were, they were too ideological. Sometimes they weren't ideological enough. But there were human beings standing up and saying, we are human beings. We are proud human beings. My neighbor means something to me. My neighbor is also a human being. And when, as you saw, uh, as, you, as you saw one of the most beautiful moments that was so short-lived that I talked about in my last book, when the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, and the Appalachian Poor White Young Patriot Party came together and said, we can work together, right? We can reach across the color lines and can work together. And there has been 45 years of dismantling that story, right? of making us blame one another. And this system counts on the silence of people. It counts on the silence of white people that says, you know what, you probably deserve to be killed or assaulted by the police. It counts on the silence of people who live in private housing to, be, uh, to stand aside when public housing is demolished or this ridiculous step forward thing, which is the step forward to oblivion plan as far as I'm, uh, I'm concerned. It, it counts on those of us who were born in this country, which used to be Indian land, to look at people who are coming now and saying, you're expendable and we should kick you out even if you are 14. So, what you are doing every, with every single last one of your campaigns is you are building a new common sense, a brand new humanism. And it could go in many different ways. I don't have a, a crystal ball, right? I don't know what type of system we're going to end up with in 10 years. We don't even know if we're going to have an earth in 20, right? But every single picket line that you walk together, every, every single action, even things that seem insignificant, like petition drives, tells a new story about what we all mean to one another, right? It puts, put, you know, it puts dignity in the word fight, and it makes terms like rainbow coalitions seem not so naive anymore, right? That we can actually get it together and turn things around in this country. And we might not be able to, but that's the type of movement that I want to be a part of until we've either won or we've lost. So I'm dedicating this talk to the memory of my good friend, Ted Gullickson. Ted was the director of the San Francisco Tenants Union for many decades, and he died last Tuesday. And I have a particular memory of Ted that is relevant to what I want to share with you today. I first met him in 1991 or 1992 on a street corner in San Francisco's Mission District. I was in my early 20s then and wanted to unload all of my radical ideas on this veteran of, uh, of the housing struggle as if he had never heard them before, right? As if they had just come because I had read uh, Karl Marx or I had read anarchism or I was starting to learn about feminism from, uh, from my sisters in the struggle. And of course, I had wonderful ideas and he very patiently looked at me, probably shook his head, and said, if you ever expect to win anything, Never forget that all politics start on the street corner. I hung out with him on that street corner, watching him as he held down conversations about tenants' rights with anyone, grandmothers, teenagers, drunks, yuppies, and even the odd landlord. He earned the right to agitate people, to ask them to do something that they weren't planning on doing by listening. So as we fluctuate between really big ideas and, phil uh, and philosophical ideas of what we are and concrete ideas about what we can do in the here and now, I want you to know that all of the alternatives, all of our futures are based on exactly what, what, what you're doing. They start in laundromats. They start with the conversations that you have as leaders and organizers on street corners. I think door knocking should be a sacrament. Right? Knocking on a stranger's door and saying, will you join us, should, uh, you know, uh, should, should be a, a sacrament. It's one of the most honored things that anybody could do. And we should also know that when you step out and you fight for housing and you fight for land, you're part of such a long tradition. 
One of the one of the hidden aspects of the civil rights movement was Martin Luther King's housing campaigns, the desegregation campaigns, and the movements that they inspired around anti-red redlining. Certainly, the struggle for land in this country goes back to the first Congress, and th congratulations to the Seattle City Council for getting rid of Columbus Day. Woohoo! And we see. It, and, 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 we, and we see new expressions, expressions that we see the idle no more movement. And we saw the very best, some of the very best people, not that they were bad people, but some of the smartest, most savvy people from the Occupy moment actually turn their energies towards defending neighborhoods, right? Taking that energy, taking that one, uh, those wonderful, wonderful ideas um, that, that were spawned, that con again, shifting that, con that, that conversation from uh, you know, away, away from having our anger at our, ourselves and our neighbors and towards the one percent. I said, okay, now I'm going to actually get to know my neighbors. And I know that here, here in, um, in Seattle, there's another great organization that was actually even doing some of that before uh, the Seattle Solidarity um, Network that I'm also quite, quite inspired by. So why in every major city is displacement even a thing anymore? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't even make much sense in a long-term ca capitalist vi uh, vi vision. One of the main reasons is that we've shifted to a primarily service-based based economy, so cities have to continually reinvent themselves over and over again just to keep the lights on, right? Just to keep a tax rate, just to make sure that the water mains get get re repaired because there is no true grassroots economic development in almost any city. And we'll actually talk about one a little later that's ac actually starting to, to take a few steps uh, that way in uh, a very surprise, surprising part. So this means that pretend that every single last member of the board, or your city council rather, I keep using the term board of supervisors, that's San Francisco term, completely agreed with the tenants union were maybe former members, supporters, and everything. They would still have a hard time saying no to some of the neighborhood destroying projects because truly we've gotten to the point where we haven't built any form of alternative economic uh, ec economic base for communities. So the only thing that we see is like, let's tear it down and rebuild it, right? Oh, let's put this thing in the middle of your neighborhood that we know is gonna generate gentrification. We know it's gonna uh, generate displacement because just like the movie Sophie's Choice, where uh, a Holocaust survivor was, was had to uh, had to choose between which kid to send to the gas uh, to to the gas chambers, cities are asked, "Do you want housing or jobs? Do you want housing or jobs? Do you want community safety or do you want community preservation?" And these are false choices. We can actually build city uh, cities from from below. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, na you know, naming the, the strategy, I don't think you shouldn't even call it a system, but the strategy of neoliberalism, almost every single last city in the United States, whether you're the shrinking Detroit or the growing Seattle, has, has this remarkable shrinkage of regulations, of austerities, uh, and, uh, you know, and privatizations of of the of the commons, and these are the things that set that that set the stage for the displacement that we're all fighting against. Uh, and I should also say that, you know, you know, oftentimes it's, it seems rhetorical to say that all issues are linked, but all of this displacement, all of this redevelopment, takes in a massive amount of surveillance and control. So when uh, when police murder happens. In, uh, in, in a predominantly African-American community or predominantly brown community, it oftentimes goes along the, uh, the spectrum of gentrification and of, and of displacement. As we saw in San Francisco just a few, few months ago where Alex Nieto was murdered in his, in his neighborhood uh, by police who thought that he had a gun. It was actually a taser and he was a, uh, uh, you know, he was a security guard who was on his way to work who got into a little bit of a disagreement with a yuppie who called the called the cops on him and it cost him his life and it cost him his life but as the great james baldwin said one of my favorite authors of all time if they come for you in the morning they're going to be back for me at night 
right? If they come for you in the morning, they're going to be back for me at night, and it's the early evening now, right? So even though some of us that have thought that, okay, you know, this issue may or may not impact me, that's okay, it's coming for you, right? In San Francisco, we have teachers that can't even afford to be part of their, um, uh, part of the communities that, that they serve. So what do we do about it? Right, because that's, that, that's the most important part, right? It's one thing to rec recognize the problems. It's one thing to build our vocabularies. But what do we do about it? So let's talk about some philosophical choices we can make, and then we'll talk about some programmatic uh, choices we can make. One is just embrace the right to the city. The right to the city, you know, its roots come in some fancy, fancy French philosopher, uh, Henri Lefebvre, and uh, you know, it was popularized by people like my friend Harmony Goldberg and Peter Marcuse. And it's the idea that people who make this city grow through their labor, right, through their work, through their participation, have the right to live here, right? And ha right, have, the, have the right to not only live here, but, ha but participate in it, to have a democratic voice, however that's expressed in your, in, in your city, and actually have control. Right? Actually have some autonomy, actually have some community collective self-determination over their city. And when I say work, you know, that you earn this right to the city through your work, I mean that any time that you produce a value for yourself or another human being, you're working. And value isn't just money, right? Although that's certainly a major part of it. Value is babysitting for your kid, babysitting for somebody else's kid. Uh, Value is what you know is watching out for the uh, watching out for your neighbors, right? For your elderly neighbors, because one of the things that displacement really goes after is survival networks. The way that people simply, get, you know, the everyday ways that people survive every day by helping each other out through mutual aid. Now, in certain forms of organizing, we think that survival networks, ah, eh, no big deal, right? We have the correct ideas, right? We have the correct line. We have, a, you know, you know, we have things worked out. We have our policies worked out, um, you know. But that, that's 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 really not, not what not what we're talking about. We're talking about looking at the ways that people survive. That's positive in the here and now, and recognizing, radicalizing them respecting them, helping people take the next step towards action, but always, rem always remembering that this fight for the right to the city is actually rooted in the strengths that are already there, sometimes right next to the nightmares, right? Right next to the worst that a city or a neighborhood could have is also is the, um, is the rose growing out of the concrete that the great uh, political philosopher Tupac Shakur talked about. The next shift that we can make is, is housing is a human right, which I think everybody in this room has already made that shift. Do we all believe in, in the idea that housing is a human right? Yeah. All right. And as we know, you know, most, you know, most city councils, at least on the West Coast, would pass resolutions in a minute saying that we believe that housing is a human right. Every human being should have one as long as they don't have to pay for it, right? As long as they don't have to challenge the privilege of developers to do what they wish, right? They would probably vote to give all the land back to the Indians as long as they didn't actually have to do it, right? Because in liberal cities like, like San Francisco and Seattle, they like non-binding resolutions. But when we fight for our housing as a human right, we also speak against those exceptions that people push. Oh, somebody doesn't deserve housing because they didn't work hard enough. They have too many kids. They were born on the wrong side of the border. And finally, we have to decide what alternative urbanism looks like. Now, I made sure that I didn't get too prescriptive because uh, I, wanted, I wanted people to take some ideas and be able to create their own idea, you know, their own programs, their own action programs. Not saying, you know, I'm not Saul Alinsky or anything like that. I'm, um, I don't do checklists. So I don't do ten rules. Here, you know, here's what you should should do. As much of a respect I had for that guy, but I want to have some frameworks. You guys fill in the blanks. So here's here's what alternative urbanism. Some of the tenets of what it could be. 
It reduces the cost of urban living by removing key areas of social consumption from the marketplace, right? So social consumption is things that we all need to consume to survive. Transportation, schools, uh, housing. The more we take the, the more that we that we take these things out of the marketplace and into the commons, it means that we all have more time to actually get to know our neighbors, right? We have more security, more uh, more political power, because we're not working 60 or 70 hours a week, right? We have more security. Expand and redefine the commons, production, and ownership for public use over private profit. I think that's pretty pretty self-explanatory. Recognize the city, even in its most dystopian form, as having the potential to generate new forms of equity, modes of production, and political participation. Create opportunities for people to experiment with new social norms, with mutual aid and social solidarity, replacing extensive competition and greed. An attempt to build popular power in excluded communities, as opposed to simply building superior ways of providing social resources in the capitalist context. So those are some ideas I'm gonna throw out. You guys figure out whether they make sense to your community or not. Develop your, uh, you know, use, you, use them, apply them to your own campaigns that are, also, that are already quite, um, qu uh, quite beautiful and quite, quite moving. And I would add, and it's not in the book, that I think that we, we should actually talk about housing reparations. Right, um, that would not be purely racial, although, but it would be very ra racial in many, many, um, in, in many aspects. We see, and I, I believe this happened in Seattle, although I haven't been able to uh, research it. But the urban renewal of the 1960s or 70s decimated the African American community in um, uh, in San Francisco. It decimated completely, erased Manila Town off the map. And in the type of system that we live now, land tenure, home ownership, things like that, are the way that families uh, you know, improve their economic status over time. So if that's been taken away, it needs to be repaired, right? Communities need to be uh, repaired. What that looks like, I have absolutely no idea, but I don't think that we can operate under racialized cap capitalism without reckoning with the past, because the past influences what we see see now and that does not mean that um, you know that that means making the system pay for what it did that doesn't mean white people writing a check or anything like that that means making doing the uh, being a part of a political movement to make more for all of us right to make for more for every color of the rainbow but not turning a blind eye to what's 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 happened be, happen, happened before so I'm almost done here um, in San Francisco First of all, nobody should take anything that I've said uh, as gospel. Interrogate it. I've dedicated over 20-something years of my life to, to housing, and in the city, that's end, the end result has been we are the most expensive city in the United States, right? So by all means, you know, the movements that I've been a part of has largely failed, right? We've largely failed, and the reason why I wanted to take some of my organizers Note, notebooks and turn them into a book, and so it could be useful. So people picking up the torch now could learn from our mistakes and our victories. One of our most beautiful victories that we've had has been the growth of the community land trust movement uh, in San Francisco. I'm uh, one of the co proud co-founders, I think the only co-founder that's still uh, you know, dumb enough to be on the board and go to all these meetings uh, uh, over again, but I'm really proud to be part of the community land trust. Uh, it got, you know, we, we, started, we started off in 2004, and it took us at least five years to have our first victory, but it was a building in Chinatown, all working class um, immigrant families, and a few seniors who, uh, who actually were successful in not only defeating the eviction, that was both City College trying to demolish it and a private developer trying to buy the rights to demolish it from the City, uh, city College. It was a very long battle. And the community land trust working with Asian Law Caucus, the tenants themselves, and Chinatown Community Development Center, we helped defeat that eviction and we turned it into a, a, a cooperative, right? That's actually owned and run by the people there. And it's hard, right? I certainly believe in the, pro in the politics of self-management, of autonomy and self-management. Those things are hard because people don't unlearn bad habits the ways that we're, we're conditioned, but it's working and it's growing. And 
until we get to the point where a lot of these good ideas are actually becoming kind of the, you know, the vanguard, so to speak, of our housing movement, I think we're going to completely, you know, have to re, uh, you know, rebuild the wheel every five years, right? What's one will be undone. And what's one, I want to see this as the, good, the threat of a good example, right? That on, at 55 Columbus in San Francisco, there are people who no longer live in threat of, the, of, of eviction, and that's forever, right? They cooperatively own their building. It's permanently affordable. No one can speculate it. No one can get greedy. It's an improvement over some of the really valiant uh, cooperative ideas that were done in the 1930s. But I think we can win. I don't think, uh, there, Ed, I think, I think we can win and we're going to lose. We're going we're, we're gonna to we're gonna lose campaigns. We're, um, you know, we're, we're going to see neighbors leave. And that's part, that, that, that's part of the path, right? But in every movement that happens, and in the housing movement, and the movement for the right to the city, I think we, we can win. Because cities, like I said, can be social justice laboratories. We know that on the, on the, uh, on the national level, we don't have, to have the strength to influence public policy on a national level right now. We don't have that. It, um, you know, some, some people certainly, when uh, compared to the alternative of George Bush, had a lot of hope for, um, uh, a lot of hope for Obama that maybe some things would be pushed back. Well, we see that we only have ourselves to rely on. We don't have Democrats, we don't have Republicans. Um, as much as I'd love to see the Green Party get up and running again, we don't have Green Party in an effect, effective uh, fighting mode, but we have each other. We have, our, we have our direct action, we have our community campaigns, but we have our cities where we can try things out. So I'm gonna end with a short passage from the book. Cities simultaneously and effortly, effortlessly embrace both utopian and dystopian potentials. Most of them were born from human-caused ecological disasters, the clear-cutting of forests, the paving of rivers and creeks. But today, the solutions to climate change are in part urban. Density can prevent sprawl, and robust public transportation is the best way to cleave drivers from private uh, automobiles. Through zoning and redlining, the political economy has always been shaped by racism and white supremacy. But it's also in cities where oppressed people most often find each other, demand self-determination, and forge coalition. Dour, alienated architecture argues with vibrant design. Cities offer up the, most, the worst that popular culture can conjure up, and then give birth to beautiful rebel music like jazz, hip-hop, and punk, which in turn become the mass culture of another person's decade. Displacement replaces all of this radical potential with spectacle. It is the change that kills off all other positive changes. But in the end, as, uh, even though capital and displacement shapes our cities, so too can resistance. Thank you very much. Um, I always hear people saying that um, San Francisco and Seattle are experiencing really similar housing crises, and I'm wondering, um, is that just something people say? Is it true? And what did, did, what did the two cities have in common, really? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, San, you know, San Francisco and Seattle are very, very similar in many, in, you know, in, in many ways. But the main one is that you, you know, we both have uh, our economic inequality is largely, not only, largely driven by the, by the tech industry, right? And the tech industry, uh, you know, when you think about it, if we were living in a more, you know, more humane system, tech industry should be the, the, the factories of today where anybody, I remember a friend, of, a friend of mine who comes from a very working class background, he's actually in the book, he became a tech worker by reading you know, back before you could download whole manuals and coding, you know, he was writing for a band and reading reading tech manuals, and he taught himself how how to use computers. Right? Anybody who has a willingness to work and willingness to learn a few new skills should be able to take advantage of it. But it's um, you know, in San Francisco, the tech industry, even entry levels, is 96% white. Right? You know, 96%. Right? That's the most could be the most Jim Crow industry that we have. Right, I'm probably it's America, so there's probably a worse one out there somewhere. But 96% white, 96% uh, people that already came from, 
from middle class backgrounds. So economic, economic inequality certainly is what holds San, Fr San Francisco and Seattle together because when you have a relatively sh small amount of people, right, being able to warp the entire market, right, and cause these great waves of, of speculation and reinventing the city just for them, right, just for this small, small group, that's eco economic, um, that's, um, that, that's economic inequality, which, which um, you know, de definitely joins, joins both cities. When did this book uh, got purchased? How long did it take to write it? So uh, the San Francisco Community Land Trust has, well, we have two, uh, two anniversaries. One was of November 1999, when a bunch of us stormed out of a Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition meeting, and we weren't happy with the solutions that were being proposed by our comrades, by our dear friends, uh, because we really felt that community ownership, not just affordable housing, as valuable as that is, and not just rent control, that we wanted a community, uh, uh, a community ownership strategy. So we went to a bar, I think it was like December 1999, and got really drunk and decided to make a land trust. So good things, and I, ironically, the social houses that I work for now also came out of another bar. So sometimes drinking is a good thing. Uh, but we also have, <laughs> but in, but in two, so in 2004, in 2004, the land trust officially incorporated and became a legal entity that had had the legal right to um, to own land. And so this housing thing is not just happening here in Seattle, but all over the United States. Right? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Every single last last city. Even I even got an email today from Flagstaff, which isn't really a city, wow. right? It's somewhere it's somewhere in between town and city, right? It's not where you think of like an urban area that's gonna uh, that, that's that's going to suffer this very quickly. But even Flagstaff, like we have this going on because of uh, people coming coming in for the tourists and wanting to take advantage advantage of that. It's happening everywhere. Okay, so uh, a friend of mine, Jack, is here, and uh, this place just got bought by a big developer, and they, uh, he's been living there for 23 years. He's bought that place several times over. And, but the thing is that, you know, those people that bought his place, uh, they're not buying it with their own money. You know, the difference between them and us is that they have access to capital, right? And uh, so, if, if we want to stop them from doing that, then we have to have access to capital or some, something about that. So I think this idea of the land trust is really uh, intriguing, but you know, how do they get the money? Well, two places, I'll try to be really brief on that. One is it's a, it's a political struggle. So the, fir the first building that we had, we, we found money uh, that was left over from the city's seismic stabilization fund. The building was was likely to fall down during the earthquake, and we did a campaign and we got the money. Uh, the city just rolled out a small sites ac acquisition fund uh, that could basically do you know, acquire small sites that are in jeopardy of displacement and take it off the speculative market. But that wasn't because the city all of a sudden woke up and said we want to do something nice for people. It was because there was political struggle. There was campaigns. All, um, ca campaigns to, to focus on that, and it was a victory. And uh, lu luckily, I can't go into the details because uh, we just entered a purchase agreement for two buildings that were just last month were in jeopardy of, of all the tenants being displaced. So it's an insider-outsider strat strategy, but it can never be done without the outside game because the land trust wouldn't have been able to just walk up to a landlord and say, hey, do you want to sell us this building Right, you know, if we hadn't already done done with our partners the campaign to win the small sites acquisition fund, and if really awesome groups like Eviction Free San Francisco weren't giving these landlords absolute friggin' hell, going to their to their doorsteps and make and making them rescind the evictions, making them back up to the point where all right, yeah, okay, I'll get rid of this and we'll get rid of this at a discount, right? So. Um, never think that it that the reason you know, certainly we need money right we need public investment to make these things happen but it's always the outs outside inside game we can never just become insiders and expect that um, even a wonderful city council I have no idea if you have a good one or not um, is um, you know 
Kit w would do these things for us without, w you know, w without the constant push and the constant demand. I wondered if you had any criticisms of the Solinsky organizing model. Um, some of my dear friends founded Seesaw. Um, I've been active in many Seesaw pickets, but I find that uh, their lack of engagement with the political uh, system is really stale. Uh, it's like direct action and winability for the sake of these campaigns. Um, and a friend of mine, Steve Beecham, who I think is one of the best community organizers for City Life, he said um, the Saul Alinsky model lacks a sort of a, uh, an anti-capitalist critique. And uh, that's why he doesn't, he doesn't like consider the City Life's work to be in line with Saul Alinsky's. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you had any criticisms for this uh, uh, rules, for, the rules and radicals and that type of uh, analysis yeah. organizing model. So first of all, I think that every organizer should read Alinsky just because it's been so foundational and influenced everybody. Whether you're running from it or you think it's the best thing in, in the world, you should read it, right? Uh, because you know it was an appropriate model at the time in many ways, right? And Alinsky also had a very strong critique of authoritarian uh, versions of, of, of government. Now, I think that when you're doing organizing, the first, whether you, you consider yourself to be a political radical or whatever that means to you, or whether you uh, consider yourself to just be going for reforms, the first few steps of good organizing whether are basically the same. You knock on doors, you talk to people, you find out what people want to fight about, right? And you, and you try to, and you try to, you try to illustrate that, that people can unite and win, no matter what. So that's, that, that's, that's uniform no matter what your ideology is. Um, what's different is that a radical organizer, you know, certainly is gonna be, uh, be, you know, a good one at least, is certainly gonna be with you as you fight your landlord, as you fight for the short-term gains that help, help you survive. But they ac actually talk about the, big, uh, about the big questions, right? In a way that's asking questions, that's dialogical, right? That says, why do you think this is happening? Is it capitalism? Is it racism? Probably both. As we see oftentimes, what I call, I call um, sexism as a hidden specter in, that, in the housing crisis. And we talk about the structures. And those are, in many organizations, the structures that are, cause these things are, um, you know, we can't, we, can't have those com we can't have those conversations. And that's, that's bad because it means that we will put all this wonderful energy into winning stuff and probably could quite win, but when it comes down to actually getting rid of the problem, the Alinsky model stops, uh, stops quite short. But then again, there's all, you know, I mean, the, um, what, what I think that Alinsky was trying to do was trying to challenge, he actually challenged two generations of leftists to become, to try to become relevant, right? Listen to what actual people want. Listen, listen, listen to what, how people describe the conditions that they're living in, listen to their aspirations. And I think that's part, while I, um, what, while I completely disagree with a lot of the Alinsky model, mainly not having to have that conversation. In my book, I even talk a little bit about how he organized the back of the yards in Chicago in a m wonderful way, and then turned out that many of the white people in that, in that neighborhood turned around and used those skills to reinforce segregation. So that's the part of the Alinsky tradition you can just get rid of, throw it in the trash. But the part where he says, you know, don't get caught up in just, you know, your own ideologies so much that you can't listen to human beings and assess things, I think that's quite, quite valuable. Yeah. You know, with the major corporations turning so many of us into tenants, I would think a tenant union expanding greatly would give us a real political clout to change things politically, and that's what we got to do, I think. What do you think? Absolutely. Build this, build this tenant, tenants union. One of the best things that you can do, you know, is build this tennis union, show up whenever you can, and, uh, but recruit, you know? Ask your friends. You know, if everybody in this room, not tomorrow, but over the, over the, over, over the coming year, you recruited 10 people, imagine what a time you would have finding an appropriate space for next year, right? 10 people. And then those, the next year, each one, 10 more people. That means you could at least take, you could take the summer off and not recruit anybody for two months, right? <laughs> uh, and it, 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 it really does, it, it, it really does come down to, you know, you know, numbers do count for something. 
two questions. One, can you tell us who Solinsky is? And then number two, can you talk about the, can you tell us about the bus blockades that have happened in the Bay Area? Yeah. What you think about okay. like the, going straight for the tech industry versus targeting developers? Yeah. So Saul Alinsky was a guy who organized in the 1930s and 40s, and he wrote a book called Rules for Radical, another one called Revelry for Radicals, that became the blueprint for many other organizations following. And he you know, he, he emphasized the cre you know creative conflict as an or as an organizing tool, and uh, had t you know ten rules. You can you can find f find them all. So the buses, my dear friends at Eviction Free San Francisco said that they were going to go and blockade the Google buses. And I said, what the f are you thinking? <laughs> you know, I, I thought that it was the stupidest idea that I'd ever heard of coming from some of the smartest people that I had ever had the honor of working with. One is that it was indirect action, right? You know, you didn't know who was getting on the bus, right? You know, if they were just, you know, making a working class wage or whether they were top, you know, top, of the, top of the chain. I had a long list of reasons why it was bad, right? Whether, and I was like, no, go after, you know, go after the head of Google, go after their boards, you know, things like that. And, and they did it, and I'm glad that they ignored me. Um, what the eviction, you know, it goes to show you that nobody is ever too much of an expert, right? Because uh, the, these, these bus blockades completely shifted the conversation around displacement in San Francisco and nationally, right? Just the fact that you even know about it, right? Um, it, you know, it helps shift, shift, shift the conversation about what, what, what are the impacts of tech. Now, I'm a little wary of doing too much tech hating, right? Uh, because I remember volunteering at the Coalition on Homelessness after the last tech bubble collapsed and finding, uh, finding my first, four, uh, first client that came in looking for housing, wanting, you know, who was a former tech worker who was living out of their really expensive SUV. So things go up and things go down, and I would like to think that even tech workers have the potential to, to think like workers one day, right? It's not gonna happen any, 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 any time soon for the majority. Uh, some, you know, some of them are quite, uh, you know, had that potential uh, and were willing to work, but it's not, it's not happening in mass. So, but it, com it, it, complete, it, it completely reframed the debate around the impacts of that. I would have loved it if the debate went a little bit further around economic inequality because I don't, I believe that even if we didn't have the tech stuff, so the Microsofts in Seattle and just about every everybody with an app uh, coming to San Francisco these days, uh, we'd still have displacement, we'd still have gentrification, we would find a different vehicle. It might be a slower moving vehicle, but we would still have that. And so um, just thinking, ju you know, just thinking about the, about the tech industry and tech workers, but it had an enormous, enormous impact. And you know, I'll close on that, thanks for giving me this segue. You know, one point that I'd like to make is that in the displacement, in the fight against displacement, we have so many distractions so many distractions. Is it the hipsters with their little funny things they do on their face with their mustaches and their proclivities for vegan donuts, right? And we, we, we can focus so much on this narrative that it's the hipsters, it's the hipsters, it's the hipsters. And if you look at hipsters, right, this is a debate that goes back to the beatnik era, right? Like a 50, 60, 60 uh, odd, odd year debate, Norman Mailer wrote about it. And, what it does is, you know, while many of these many of these individuals are quite annoying, right? Uh, but they're not the people calling the shots. They're not the people that are signing the eviction order. They're not the people that are financing your grandmother's eviction, right? They're not holding capital. And I think that you know a far more potent model, you know, and this this might be a heresy around hipsters and everything. First of all, let's go after, the, go after the big guys. Leave those guys alone, right? But maybe we should organize them. Maybe we should organize the hipsters because, and if this sounds, if this sounds ridiculous, think, think back. I don't think that you guys should do it, right? I think you guys should organize who you're organizing, right? But maybe there's, you know, may, you know maybe there's a space for race, race traders, and maybe there's a space for class traders to, to take up this work. I've seen it happen before. In the 1960s, there was this group called the White Panther Party. The White Panther Party looked and said, "All these, um, 
You know, there's all these apolitical hipsters. There's all these hippies that aren't supporting black power, that aren't supporting the, the, the fight uh, against uh, Vietnam. They're just tuning in and dropping out. And they said, let's have a total assault on culture using the rock music that they wanted to listen to and bringing new ideas and bringing, peop uh, and, and, and br uh, bringing many people to a brand, brand new understanding. Maybe that's what, maybe we should be cutting the other side's coalition down a little bit. Maybe we should be hacking the other side's coalition. Maybe we should think about reaching out to the trade trade unions because we always know that, the, you know, we go down to City Hall around some development thing, you know the trades unions are usually gonna be on, not on your side, right, in most cities. Maybe we should be thinking about what alternative development is so they can get, they can get their jobs uh, through other means than destroying the neighborhoods that many of them come from. So those are just some ideas. I know you have many things to talk about. Um, I hope I was of use. That's all I want to do is be of use. Thank you. A friend of mine was in Japan, and if uh, somebody came in and tried to buy your place of residency and then kick you out, they have to negotiate with the, the tenants, and they have to pay them. So. Um, you know, what do you know about that, and, and what is the prospect of, of that happening here? So, uh, the prospect of any any anything posit positive happening on the national picture here in the United States, or even in on the local level, all depends on uh, on organizing, on community organizing, and labor organizing, and putting the rights of the city and the human right uh, front and center in um, you know, in in these campaigns. Uh, in you know, in mo you know, most Western European countries, uh, are mu they have a much higher standard for housing pre housing preservation. Uh, there's there's still gentrification. There's still capitalist um, cities, but uh, generally there's much higher levels of re of relocation rights, of, of tenant rights, and other forms of cooperative housing and social housing. Um, and certainly in uh, you know countries like Venezuela have come a long long way over the past past 10 years towards getting closer to housing as a human rights by direct uh, directly investing in brand new affordable housing taking some of the the country's oil oil profits you also see in eastern europe the former communist uh, countries um, where um, the, housing, the, the housing there was privatized so quickly that you had over 30,000 people displaced in just a short amount of time uh, after, after the conversion, especially in, in um, countries like I've been to in, in Hungary. So nobody at this point in history has elevated housing to an absolute hu um, human right, but some are a lot farther, uh, uh, farther along than us and some, um, you know, and some even a little behind. A few years ago, there was a special report from uh, the UN actually had a special rapporteur who uh, toured all of the United States, talked to many different organizations and even the real estate um, industry, and really, um, really criticized the United States' approach to housing as, approach, as, as opposed to you know, most other industrialized countries. So, uh how do you see this tying into the whole uh, general neoliberal model, you know, of uh, workers not being considered stakeholders and, uh, you know, uh, people that own their houses not really being stakeholders? You know, there's a lot of people, you know, because of the subprime crisis, mm -hmm. you know, they're losing their houses, which they supposedly own, you know, and that's all a big scam, too, because... You know, the capitalists actually have a word for this. It's called churning, right? Right. So they sucker these people into like, uh, you know, getting these uh, loans and thinking that they're going to have security and everything. Then they crash the uh, the uh, the market, and then they go and buy it back, you mm -hmm. know, for nothing. So you asked about uh, about work, you know, workers' stake in the economy, whether that be at the workplace, or um, you know, in. In, in that in people's housing situations and you know I think it's you know, be, you know to preface I think it's really interesting that in the United States many great advocacy and organizing organizations are so split up and so siloed where we have organ one organization fights for people's rights on the job the other one fights for people's rights uh, against landlords or for the human right of housing 
and it you know really shows this kind of almost silly amount of speci specialization that 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 we have as a as a movement. I think uh, getting to the point where we have uh, put the idea of hum the human right of housing more central means that trade unions need to uh, pick up the man mantle, but also that uh, workers. Need, yeah, I mean, sorry, uh, ten, tenant organizations also need to take the labor question very seriously. You know, if, you know, if for, um, for no other reason is that it splits the other, um, the other side's coalition, I don't think any, any carpenter in the world wants to build a building that they, ha they or their family could never afford to live in, th their communities could never afford to live in, or would put gentrification and displacement pressures on the rest of uh, re the rest of the city or the surround surrounding neighborhood. Uh, quite to the contrary, I think that um, you know most rank and file workers want to, you know, build socially useful buildings. You know, uh, buildings where um, you know people who are like them who can. Uh, who you know who reflect their communities can also also live in so it means backing up and not just for different organ organizations and trade unions to um, not just meet at city hall over fighting over some development but actually making a long term plan for al uh, for alternative um, alternative development in um, you know in, in cities you know that puts people's needs first before the profit uh, the profit motive. Um, you see that in um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio uh, was an amazing example of where a um, a laundry warehouse was about ready to go out of business, and the city actually helped turn it into an owner-run uh, cooperative. So, not only is that a good thing for the hundreds of families that get work through the cooperative, but it's also a good thing for uh, for the politics of a city because now all of a sudden everyday people because they have income security can look at new development and analyze what they want and what they don't want outside of um, kind of the hostage situation of urban development uh, where you either have to have housing or jobs jobs or housing and that's um, you know that's that's very important so um, and you know certainly you know certainly in the in, in the housing realm you know uh, we don't ha housing doesn't have to be purely for profit. We can have massive amounts of, of uh, housing that is not for profit in every single last city, especially forms of cooperative housing that, in addition to providing the affordability and the stability, also makes ask, you know, because the interesting thing about a community land trust or any form of cooperative housing, it also asks the individual to take personal responsibility in their community to help manage the uh, the building, to help the neighborhood uh, develop in a posi in a positive way, so it kind of completely short circuits the uh, philosophical debates we off that often stifle us. You know, how do you see uh, this uh, uh, cooperative housing model mm -hmm. stacks mm -hmm. up against public housing? Because see, Seattle is tearing down all the public housing. Yeah. And, and they're privatizing it. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of leaves all those people that used to yeah. live there in the lurch. But, you know, uh, this uh, cooperative housing model, you never hear about that. Yeah. Well, you need both. I don't think it's an either or. Public housing can be, re, you know, can, can be reimagined by and for the people who actually live, live there. It's been the uh, the number one best protection against homelessness, uh, despite all of the problems. But when, in San Francisco during the Hope Six program, you saw many tenants uh, organize uh, around the Hope Six process of demolishing their buildings and rebuilding it. Their demands were very very simple. They wanted the process to be something that helped stabilize the community, to buildings to be things that they could come back to that would get their kids into um, good paying construction jobs. It wasn't anything too fancy. It was very bread and butter, but we saw a, a massive missed opportunity 
yeah, in most parts of the United States, uh, to really uh, to really rebuild pub public housing from the from the ground up as an anti-displacement tool, as an economic uh, development tool, basically as a New Deal for cities, right? To put uh, to really put people back to work. Unfortunately, most cities, and certainly the Clinton administration, they just weren't uh, w weren't interested in going down that route. So, cooperative housing is extremely important. Right, you know, cooper, uh, cooperative housing, like I mentioned, uh, when it's done, uh, when it's done well, when it's done uh, in a permanently affordable way, can stop displacement, can help take buildings that are currently in jeopardy of going to market, and putting them into a different sector of of, of the economy that is there to help the, help the um, help the community stay stay and grow in place. Uh, so we need both. You know, uh, it's not it's not an either or. How do you see the city supporting maybe us getting some kind of financing to actually create land trust? Well, you know, I think it's um, it's all about a matter of uh, building community pressure for those kinds of reforms because I think that you know policy tools like land banking and community land trusts are key to making sure that the land that we live on is affordable in perpetuity, right? Because that's the problem with development. It's that it's this speculation, this quick turnaround profit where, um, you know, someone who has the capital can just buy all the land and displace all the people that are on it. And that is a, you know, a, a story that runs throughout history, right? So these are um, big challenges, but I think that um, other cities have tackled it with, uh, uh, you know, like, land trusts and land banking and kind of taking lands out of the private market and holding them in, in public hands. And I think that that's a good way to maintain permanent affordability for folks. In terms of the political prospects of that happening, I mean, I think that um, now's the time to start talking about those things. And I think that, um, you know, looking at corporations, looking at, um, you know, <laughs> you know the, the wealthy uh, for, uh, you know, creating a tax system that would support that kind of land reform is probably the way to go, f go forward with that. Now, what that means in terms of the city council, what direction they'll go, it's probably too soon to say this year. Yeah, but do, you, do you have some examples where of cities that, that have a, are doing this? Well, Seattle. I mean, you know, the Seattle has the Homestead uh, Land Trust, and they do great work. And during the foreclosure crisis, they were going out and buying up all these properties that had for been foreclosed on. and were way below market that they would have otherwise been. And they expanded their pool of, of, of land that was held in this trust. And now there are you know, low income to moderate income families living in those buildings. So I think Seattle is already doing it. It's just a matter of bringing it to scale. And I think that's the challenge, yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Yeah, you bet, thank you.